Today's video was recorded on September 13th, 2022, and this is going to be our seventh and final lesson in this series on the background of the Transfiguration account. Today's lesson is going to be a summary of what we've done over the past six lessons, and I'm going to, as best I can, see if we can't come up with two overarching areas of meaning that help us categorize the individual aspects we've studied over the past few weeks. And then also, I want to propose one more biblical illusion that seems to connect the New Testament narrative of the Caesarea Philippi event to Psalm 42. So Jesus, the Gospel writers, Paul, and the rest of the New Testament writers, they rely heavily on the use of allusion to the Old Testament to bring forward the meaning of that sacred text into their present context. And when we understand that this is how the New Testament is written, we begin to pay close attention to the little details that point us back to the Old Testament. And doing this adds a depth and a breadth to the New Testament that increases our understanding of the message of the text, and more importantly, helps make the reading of the Bible more enjoyable for us. As a woman said to me many years ago after a class that I taught, she said, I feel like I'm learning the rules to the Bible. And then she continued, she said, it's like watching baseball with my husband. When I didn't know the rules to baseball, I was confused and I didn't care to pay attention. But when I took it upon myself to understand the rules of the game, I found much more enjoyment and excitement while I was watching the game. And I think this is exactly what happens when we learn how those New Testament writers are using the Old Testament to carry the message forward into that first century context. So I hope that you enjoy this summary of the background to the Transfiguration account, and I pray that it helps you discover the depth of the New Testament text and that you would have an increased enjoyment of reading your Bible. Enjoy today's lesson. Okay, folks, let's get started tonight. And this is going to be a summary of the entire series that we've just completed on the Transfiguration. So we did six lessons on the Transfiguration, which means this one is part number seven. And I'm just going to use it to wrap up a couple things uh, as we leave this particular topic. Now, the background painting that we have, I've used this one before. It's called the Transfiguration by Raphael, painted in around 1520. And the painting is actually a tall painting, so I had to crop out just the top with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah and the disciples. So if you look at the whole painting, it's a little bit, it's much taller. There's a lot more going on in that scene. But for this uh, presentation and for this video, I've just cropped out the part with Jesus. So, okay, this is going to be a summary. What did we learn over the past six lessons on the cultural background to the Transfiguration account? So what I want to do is try to put a bow on it to try to bring in the, the everything that we looked at into just a couple different categories. So when I started out this series at the beginning of the summer, my goal was to look at this transfiguration event through the lens of first century Jewish culture as best that we can. So what can we know, not only about what were the cultural aspects or cultural ways of thinking from the first century, but actually everything that leads up to the first century. So something that we would call the second temple period. And the Second Temple period stretches from the completion of the Old Testament when they came back to rebuild the temple after the exile to Babylon, all the way up until the temple was destroyed around 70 AD. But I would even take that period of time all the way up to writings like the book of Revelation, which happens uh, around 90 AD. So throughout the first century. So it's about 500 year period of time and as we've mentioned a couple of weeks ago this is a period of time where the Jews are really wrestling 
with their sacred text, the Hebrew Bible. And of course, when Jesus shows up, the Hebrew Bible, that's, what, that's his Bible. That's Paul's Bible. That's all, the, all of the disciples, right? The New Testament is not, it's not written down or recognized as sacred scripture until later. So that first, those first century uh, Jewish disciples that went out and are the roots of Christianity are only dealing with the Hebrew Bible and the stories that they've been telling about Jesus. So it's really important if we want to know what the thinking was for the culture of that time, you have to study everything that led up to that. And I think this is one area that you know, people can be deficient on because, well, it's just not easy, right? We don't have the cultural aspects at our fingertips. You actually have to do some work to understand that um, cultural thinking or the theological ways that they thought about the world during that time, because it really does help illuminate the New Testament. Now, the other thing that we did was rabbinic thought, and that's really important to understanding so much of the New Testament. Because Jesus, he's called rabbi in the New Testament. The disciples are disciples of a rabbi. And in that Jewish culture, to be a disciple of a rabbi is a long-term training program. It's not just, I went to school for a couple years and got a degree. It's a 15-year-long commitment. And it's not a commitment of simply knowledge, but to be like your rabbi. Much more like a long-term mentorship that we might have here in the West. So the idea is not just to know what Jesus knows, but to become what Jesus is, to be like your rabbi. And so the disciples' mindset, that's their mindset, to become just like Jesus, because that's the cultural model. You want to be what the rabbi is. So the disciples are in the mindset of that. Paul, he was a disciple of Rabbi Gamliel. And Paul addresses the issues that he deals with in a very rabbinic way. So what we can do is we can study rabbinic thought because it's Eastern and they're wrestling with the Old Testament, different than Greek thought about the Old Testament. It's Eastern thought about the Old Testament. And so if we study that rabbinic text, you can often see how they're intersecting with the New Testament and the, and the things uh, that either Jesus says, does, or Paul says, does, or writes. So these are, it's very helpful for us to go back and look at rabbinic thought. And then finally, what we've done and we'll do more tonight is look at the allusions to the Old Testament. So Jesus, through his actions, the gospel writers, Paul, and everyone else who, who contributed to the New Testament, they make prodigious use of the Old Testament to communicate about God, about his kingdom, about the Messiah, and not just uh, the Old Testament or the Old Testament in Hebrew, but also the, what's called the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, or even the what are called the Targum, and the Targums are Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible that often add uh, illuminating information. They paraphrase. They help us understand at least what they were thinking at the time. And so these allusions, well, they may be just one word. They might be just one action. But they're going to cause the mind of the hearer or the reader to be brought back to something in that Hebrew Bible. And all of the meaning that goes along with that gets sucked in to the story through one word or one phrase. So, just like in the Transfiguration story, when Jesus takes three disciples up the mountain, and the gospel writers are sure to include three named disciples, it causes the mind of the first century Jewish audience to go back to Moses. Moses is a redeemer of Israel, and when he ascends the mountain to see God, three named disciples. And so what's happening on the Transfiguration? Well, we understand that, or that for audience understands it, by what is known, and it's the stories from Exodus. And we'll talk a little bit more about allusions. We'll talk a little bit more about allusions to the Hebrew Bible at the end of this, because, boy, there's more, there's more than I could even uh, put in this 
six-week lesson. So anyways, this was my goal, to try to study it only through those, uh, those lenses or from, the, from that perspective. Now, the thing is, and I mentioned this at the very uh, early on, is it's a mystical text, which makes it very difficult. Right? Mystical means to have mystery, awe, fear, and wonder. And you can see the disciples when Jesus is transfigured. At the same time that you can see something amazing, you can be afraid, you can be overwhelmed. Right? There's with mystical, there's fascination. Uh, the mystical transcends human understanding. By the very definition, God is mystical. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. It's not easy for us. We attempt many times to put God in the box, but he's, mix, he's mystical. So we need to hold loosely to something like this, the transfiguration event. That's what I was at least trying to do throughout this whole series. Because by its very nature, it transcends human understanding. You can't take this, put it in a lab, and say, okay, how did, let's solve scientifically how Jesus transfigured. It doesn't work that way. So what do we do? Well, we gaze at it. We meditate on it. You allow God to bring insight into the meaning behind it. And one analogy that I would use, if you haven't thought much about it, when you gaze at the mystical, it's like looking at a diamond. So if you look at this diamond here, well, which facet do you focus on? Which facet of the diamond uh, defines the whole? Well, none. They're all amazing. And, you know, you could turn that diamond or you could move the light. And every time you turn it and move the light, you'll see something magnificent that you didn't see before. The mystical is really awesome like that when you study it because you can just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And as you gaze at the mystical, just like looking at a diamond, if you were to take a diamond and just set your eyes on it and just gaze, the, the beauty that comes out of it uh, is really amazing. And you begin to see the, just the uniqueness of it. Uh, you can do the same thing with a, with a, a wonderful work of art or even, uh, say, a Persian rug, a beautiful rug. You just sit and let the sunlight change on the rug, and it's amazing the details that pop out on something that's exquisite like that. So that's what we're trying to do, is you don't want to oversimplify it. You study each little facet, let the facet speak for itself, and then, you know, marvel at the amazing beauty of the overall uh, account of the transfiguration, just like you would a diamond. So, this, is, this was a mystical. It transcends our understanding. So, we allow God to work through the Holy Spirit as we increase our understanding, as we become more familiar with the text and increase our understanding of the, of the cultural nuances that, that go into this um, account. Well, it begins to work on you, and then God gives you insights into that. And one of the things that I mentioned uh, very early on in week one, was a technique. It was used very popular in the, um, in the Middle Ages in the church, which is called Lectio Divina, which is a divine reading. That's what it means, divine reading. You read the text aloud a few times, slowly, and then you spend some time in contemplation. You just allow the text to sink in. Drop your agenda of trying to solve the problem. You allow the Holy Spirit to work and give you insight into the text. Do that multiple times where you really give yourself some space, not trying to cram in five minutes of scripture reading in the morning, but give yourself some space. You do that multiple times, you'll see deeper into the biblical text. Very helpful when engaging the mystical. So, okay, so today is going to be a bit of a summary, a summary on what was going on, what can we understand from the transfiguration event and i think what i've what i've come up with and you may be able to come up with more or you'll be the judge on whether i've done this correctly or not or or adequately or not um 
I, but I think there's two main points that stand out as we've gone over all of this background. So the two main points are, first of all, that Jesus is the Redeemer of Israel. And he's the one who's going to redeem Israel. And oh, by the way, according to the Hebrew Bible then, the Redeemer of Israel is also the one who's going to be the king of the whole world, the Messiah, the one to redeem the entire cosmos. It's a new age. So this one is, is going to be almost entirely biblical illusion, as we'll look at tonight. The second one, if we came in from the other side, we would say, what is it telling us? Is something about Jesus's heavenly nature. And we saw over the weeks that this lines up with certain theological ideas that were prevalent in the first century. It's the ideas that he's the heavenly righteous, that he's the last Adam. He's the one who restores the glory that Adam lost. He's the heavenly man, the king, or the ideal judge, the embodiment of that aspect of God where all things are created, who just in human form, you don't get that. During the transfiguration, now it's revealed the heavenly reality of who Jesus is. Okay, so I think these are the two main takeaways. Now let's, um, let's add some details to this so that we can see then what's backing up the, these ideas. So, the Redeemer of Israel. Now, I think for most Christians, Western Christians, that is, recognizing this message, the message of the transfiguration as showing Jesus to be the Redeemer of Israel, the Messiah, is probably the harder one to see, right? We want to focus on the divine nature of Jesus that's being revealed. The Redeemer of Israel is probably the harder one. It's more difficult because it comes through biblical allusions. It's all allusions to the Old Testament. So the first thing is, as we've noted many times over, Jesus is being compared to Moses. Moses is considered the first redeemer of Israel, the one who was chosen by God to lead them out of the bondage of slavery, out of Egypt, right? Delivers the law, the Torah, I shouldn't say law, the Torah, the instruction manual to the, to the Israelites. How do you live with the presence of God fully dwelling here on earth? So what we find in the, in the Transfiguration account are these allusions back to Moses, Exodus 24 and Exodus 34. Exodus 24, where Moses leads three named disciples up the mountain. And then in Exodus 34, well, Moses has his own Transfiguration event. His face was radiating light. And so now you can take it back and say, oh, perhaps Jesus is a redeemer just like Moses. Okay, that's, that would be the biblical illusion. Another one that we only mentioned briefly is Deuteronomy 18.15. Now, Deuteronomy 18.15, I'm going to turn there in a minute. This is God is going to tell the Israelites, I'm going to be sending a prophet just like Moses. So the reason they're expecting someone just like Moses, well, because that's what God says. So if you have your Bible, turn, let's read it in Deuteronomy 18.15, because this is going to be a direct quote uh, inside the Transfiguration account. So Deuteronomy 18.15, um, I'm going to use the New Heart English Bible, this version, so the NHEB. And what you see here is God is saying to Moses, there's going to be a point in time in the future where I'm going to raise up somebody, an Israelite, who's going to be, I'm going to put my words in his mouth, and he's going to be a prophet, just like I did with Moses. Okay? So, uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, it says this, The Lord your God will raise up to you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brothers like me. Now, that's, this is actually Moses telling the Israelites. 
Now, if you read down just a couple of verses, which I won't go over, you'll see where God says, I'm going to put the wor- I'm going to put my words in his mouth and he'll speak. But so the Lord your God is going to raise up a prophet from the midst of you, from the brothers. So he's going to be, uh, he's going to be Jewish and Israeli. And then it says, and you shall listen to him. Oh, okay. So we're going to have to listen to him. Yes. Okay. So what does it say in the transfiguration? A cloud came, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Mm, So it's a direct quote. God, when he speaks, is quoting Deuteronomy. Listen to him. Now, if if you're sitting in that first century audience, and you hear that, you hear those words, listen to him, your mind goes right here, and you shall listen to him. And so just that little illusion brings you back to the story of Moses. It also brings you to the point in Deuteronomy where Moses says, oh, by the way, I'm going to raise up a prophet out of one of your brothers, which means he's going to be a Jew. And oh, by the way, you have to listen to him. Now, did the people in Israel want to listen to Jesus, at least the religious leaders? Many people did like what Jesus was saying. But of course, the priests and the Levites didn't want to give up their power. Maybe the Pharisees and some of these, the splinter groups were so concerned about doing it the right way that they couldn't see who Jesus was. They weren't listening to him. Okay, so we go back to this. Redeemer of Israel. You have all of those about Moses. And so the mind, again, the mind of that first century audience gets pointed directly to Moses. Then, in the last lesson, we looked at not only Psalm 43, which is a psalm about redemption, we looked at the Midrash on Psalm 43. So that's a rabbinic interpretation of Psalm 43. Send our generation to Redeemer. Send out your light and your truth. And then they interpret that. The light is Elijah. The truth is the Messiah. So those point right to there. And then we looked at um, Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 is, is also quoted in Luke's version of the Transfiguration. My chosen one. That's a messianic. So you can see what's happening. Little words, little phrases point you back to the Redeemer of even Jesus' own actions, point you back to uh, Moses as the first Redeemer, Jesus as the second Redeemer, and he is the Redeemer of Israel, which then carries with it all of the implications of Messiah and the deliverance for the whole world. So it's a much bigger deal than just saying he's the Redeemer of Israel if you understand what the Redeemer of Israel represents. So, okay, here's a great example of all these biblical allusions. Now, what about the other side, right? Jesus' heavenly nature. What went into this? Well, we, you see that by the first century, the, the audience has an idea of what the righteous are going to be like in heaven. And you even find a little bit of this in Paul. Uh, you know, you will be like a star in the heavens. And that's what they thought, that you would ascend to be a star in the heavens, that you would shine, your righteousness would shine. And so to see uh, Jesus in, in this transfigured state, the first thing that comes up is he, he's part of the heavenly righteous. That's how you see heavenly figures. Now, he's more than that, no doubt. But that's at least one of them. And we looked at a couple uh, extra biblical texts that help us understand at least the thinking that comes out of uh, that first century audience. So when we're on this side about the heavenly nature, Yes, it leads back eventually to the Old Testament. For instance, in Daniel, there is a transfiguration-like description. But it's also the thinking that was going on for the people who lived at that time. Another one we noted was the last Adam. This is a theological concept that comes out of the first century. And I'll show you more with John. John's gospel is telling you he's the, he's the last Adam. But the last Adam, there's a big theological concept. The first Adam failed in his, what he was in, supposed to do. The idea, if you remember, the first Adam 
was clothed in, glory, in the glory of God. So he radiated light. And what do we see at the transfiguration? The radiating of light. And so you would say, aha, when the Messiah comes, the glory of Adam will be restored. Just like it was in the garden before sin. Sin mars the glory of God. So he's the last Adam. And then finally, which is connected to this last Adam theological business, is Jesus is the heavenly man. That's what Paul calls him. And that idea of the heavenly man is in use in the first century. And the heavenly man is the man in the heavens who then is the image of the invisible God, as Paul says in Colossians. So it's the manifestation of God in the finite, the heavenly man, so that we, human beings, Adam and Eve first, as our uh, ancestors, and then all of us, can be made in the image of God, even though God has no image. So this is what they're struggling with. Jesus is the heavenly man, and this is what Paul's going to say, and John's going to say, and they do it in all of their creative ways that are cultural, rather than having a theological textbook that explains it out uh, in multiple paragraphs so that we Westerners can understand. Okay, this is what I think that if we had to boil down everything we did in six weeks is what we would come up with. Redeemer of Israel. And, of course, Jesus is heavenly or divine nature. Now, I've talked a lot today about this idea of biblical illusion. And so what I want to do tonight is end with a couple more illusions that come out of the Gospels, and especially one, ones that are going to tie us to, back to Psalm 42 and 43. Illusions can be dicey. You can look at something in the text and think, now, wait a minute, is that am I?" hallucinating? Am I thinking that's pointing me back to the Old Testament? And it's not. But boy, when you get a strong sense that that illusion is pointing you back to something, it's probably there. But what I want to do before we get to the one about Psalm 42 and 43, I want to give you an, an, an example of how powerful these illusions can be to point your mind in a certain direction that gospel writers want you to go. Okay? So this is going to also help you, as we've talked tonight, uh, understand the message of John. John's gospel is what I'm talking about. And his message that Jesus is the last Adam, just like Paul says in Romans. And in a sense, what John is saying is creation is happening all over again. Humanity itself, as descendants of the first Adam, are being re reborn. There's a rebirth happening. It's a new humanity. There's a new age. And so John's gospel is structured to tell us that, but it's built into the structure of his gospel. Now, here's what we did. When we talked about the last Adam, uh, I mentioned this verse. I'll look at it in a minute, but I mentioned it this verse from John. So John shows the ministry of Jesus as a new creation. How does John start his gospel? In the beginning was the Word. So just like Genesis 1, now that's clearly pointing you back to Genesis 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so in Jesus, in this ministry of Jesus and his death resurrection, all creation's being renewed. Now, of course, Jesus represents that last or second Adam he fulfills what the first Adam failed to do. He's the king over all of creation because he was able to maintain his kingship over God's creation, where the first Adam failed. Now, John never says this explicitly. It's all through allusion and, you, and, and some understanding of the first century audience of this theological concept. So we see in John 19.5, this is where Jesus is in front of Pilate. Pilate leads Jesus back out in front of the Jewish leaders, and he's wearing a crown and a purple robe. Uh, obviously, this is sign signifying that Jesus is a king. And then he's going to say, Behold the man. 
or here is the man. And the man, or Adam in Hebrew, is man or humanity. So, behold, Adam. And it's a really cool thing the way John's putting this together. So here's what, let's look at it right here. So just so you know, John tells the story differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So John tells us that Jesus was presented to the Jewish leadership as the king. And then you get this phrase. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's a little bit different chain of events. So you have to know that John is, he has a theological objective in mind. So it says this, Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple garment. And he said to them, the he there is Pilate, and he said to them, look, here is Adam, the man. And of course, the man, Adam, is depicted as a king. And in Jewish mystical thought, there was this Adam Kadman, the original man. And the original man was the man in heaven, the heavenly man, who provides the image, right, that we need. But he's depicted always as a king who rules over God's creation. So John's audience gets the reference because they have the context. So this is how John's engaged it. Now I want to show you one more because it's, well, because it's cool, but it, 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 it helps you understand the depth of John and how he's using the Bible or these allusions to tell you something theologically. So John has this thread, goes throughout his entire gospel. And there's an allusion here, back to the first Adam, and it has to do with the garden. Gan Eden in Hebrew, the Garden of Eden. And that's the place, the place where God originally placed Adam. And so, the first Adam was given responsibility to maintain the garden, God's creation. Tend the garden. Of course, he fails. So if Jesus is the last Adam, then what would his responsibility be? Well, the same thing as the first, to tend the garden. And that's a metaphor for take care of God's creation, to oversee God's creation, to maintain the garden. So what we see in John, in the death, resurrection of Jesus, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus are all set in a garden. And there's this one really cool verse here, John 20, 15. I'll show you in a minute. There's a dialogue happening between Jesus in his resurrected state, because remember, new creation is happening, and Mary Magdalene. Mary the Magdalene. And so what happens is, in the dialogue, the text tells us that Mary didn't recognize Jesus. And then it says this, she thought he was the gardener. And oh, by the way, he is. So it's like the Adam is back in the garden, but this time is different. That's what John wants to show you. Humanity is, there's a new creation to humanity in Jesus. But it has these little teeny details. So let me show you this. John 20, verse 14 and 15. Again, New Heart English Bible. This is a dialogue between Mary and Magdala and Jesus. So it says, When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? She, supposing him to be the gardener. Right there. And then, of course, she thinks you're the gardener. You may have carried him away. But do you see 
what John's pointing out is Adam is back in the garden. And what's really cool about this, by the way, what John is telling us is that there has been a reversal from the original Adam in the original Garden of Eden. So that first garden, you have life. Yes? God creates a human being and gives them life, and there's the tree of life. But what was introduced through one man was death. Death was introduced to the world. This is what Paul is saying in Romans. Sin and death came through one man. And just like one man brought sin and death into the world, one man can bring everlasting life from this world. So the Garden of Eden story is a life-to-death story. But then John comes along, and he says, no, the last Adam is back in the garden, but this time he doesn't fail, right? Jesus does not fail as the Adam. And so what happens? Out of death, there's new life, a new beginning. So there's a betrayal of Judas because Satan entered him. And then there's a death, just like the death that overcomes all of humanity. But Jesus resurrects through the power of God. And now there is life out of that death, a new beginning. It's a new era going forward now for humanity. So it's very cool the message that John gives us by simply pointing out the garden. Okay, that's the power of a biblical illusion. And my point in showing you the one about John, by the way, just just because we've been talking about the last Adam, and it's very helpful to see John's uh, how powerful it is in John's gospel. But we often miss that one of the primary ways that the New Testament writers are communicating through the gospel and Paul and everybody else is through those biblical illusions. So we have to pay attention. The moment you see something that looks a little bit out of place, where's it coming from in the Old Testament? And that can often help you understand then what the author is trying to tell us. And I'm not sure that in the West here, we can appreciate that they understood those references in ways that we can't. And it is far deeper, more profound, I think, than sometimes we understand. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you a, some biblical allusions. So I wanted to just lead up to this before we get there. I want to show you some biblical allusions from the Transfiguration account that are going to point us back to Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. If you remember over the course of this study, if you've been with us the whole time, you'll pick up Psalm, you'll understand the, the significance of Psalm 42 and 43. If this is your first time, well, use this video as a, you, re, you read the summary of the book before you went to read the book. Go back to the beginning and watch one through six. You'll see more details as we fleshed out everything I'm telling you today. Okay, so Psalm 42, Psalm 43, we mentioned numerous times that the lo geographical location of those two psalms is right here, Mount Hermon, northern part of Israel. Let me show you a map real quick. Always good to understand the geography. The land of Israel is helping the message of the Bible move along. So you have the Mediterranean Sea just to the west. You have Jerusalem down here in the mountains. There's Jerusalem. You have the Sea of Galilee. You have the Dead Sea down here at the south. And then in the very northern part, so the top of your screen, Mount Hermon, right where Israel ends, Lebanon, Syria begin. And if we went a little bit closer to that, what we see is the event that happens right before the Transfiguration, which is the event at Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is located right at the very base of Mount Hermon. It's one of the headwaters of the Jordan River. And now, one of the questions that scholars have wrestled with, and continue to wrestle with, why did Jesus walk his disciples, which, by the way, it's about 26 or 27 miles from the Sea of Galilee, Uphill, by the way, uphill, because the Sea of Galilee is below sea level, 
from the Sea of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi? What was the intention? What was his purpose of taking that journey? Because, by the way, uh, Caesarea Philippi, thoroughly pagan place. Caesarea Philippi was the capital city for Herod Philip. That's why it's called Philip Caesarea is what it is. It's Herod Philip. He put his capital there. Rome would have been a huge presence there because he's, he's representing Rome in, that, in, the, in this region. The god Pan, who's half goat and half man, Pan was worshipped there. It's a very dark worship of Pan. It's a wild god. So why would he do that? Why would he walk his disciples for one lesson, right, to go up there? Well, look at this study. If the transfiguration is connected to Psalm 42 and 43, and those two psalms are geographically located in the region of Hermon, well, then he goes there as the highlight to what he's doing. Right? He doesn't say a word. And that's very, that would be very normal for a rabbi to do. The audience, if Jesus is a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, the audience is always looking for him to engage the text, whether it's through his words or action, that's going to point you to something in the Old Testament, because that's what rabbis do. So everything he says and does is scrutinized for where is he pointing us in the, in the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, I should say. So Jesus has a purpose, and he's integrating the text into his actions as he moves his disciples north towards uh, Mount Hermon and Caesarea Philippi. So here's what we're going to do. I want to take these two, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, and of course you can always add in that Midrash that we looked at during the last lesson about Psalm 43, but these two Psalms, as, as I'd mentioned in this study, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 are connected. Scholars think at some point somebody separated them. But I think they think it was one psalm because the, there's a common refrain and it's got a common theme. It's about redemption. So in Psalm 42, we realize, okay, they're located at Mount Hermon. That's the geographical area. You get to Psalm 43, we know, hey, the whole thing's about redemption. We looked in the last lesson about sending out your light and your truth. Send to redeemers to this generation. Send out your light and your truth, and I will let them guide me. Back into your presence, God. That's redemption. Back into the presence of God. Who are the light? Whose light and whose truth? Well, it's Elijah and the Messiah. That's what the Midrash says. And that's when we get to, to the transfiguration event. There is Elijah, there's Messiah. They're the, new, they're the redeemers. Okay, so we have the transfiguration then, and we can say, well, look, Elijah and, and Messiah are there. The transfiguration points to Jesus as the redeemer of Israel. And so we have one more quadrant. What's right there? What's that one? And is it connected to Psalm 42? Well, that's what I want to look at and consider that there's some biblical illusions going on here. Okay? So the event that takes place right before the transfiguration is Caesarea Philippi. Where's Caesarea Philippi? At the base of Mount Hermon. So at least that matches. Okay? And remember, we're talking, this is just a, rem a reminder, we're dealing with biblical illusion. One word, one phrase can be something that points you back to the text, the Hebrew Bible. That's how powerful it is. Okay, so I want to look at Psalm 42 and some of the things that are going to show up in Psalm 42. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, again from the New Heart English Bible. So Psalm 42, 1 and 2. It starts like this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? That's the, the desire for redemption to be back in God's presence. But look at this phrase right here. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. They add that description. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God. Now, the thing is, 
that phrase doesn't show up that often. Now, most of the time it does. It's either in Samuel or Kings. Like in First and Second Kings, there's a lot of dealing with between Israel and the nations around them, and you get the comparisons between the living God of Israel versus the dead gods or the fake gods of the nations around them. Okay? Now, living God in the Psalms only shows up three times in 150-some Psalms. So, one of them happens to be Psalm 42. So, if we go back to this list right here, we plop in the living God. Okay? Now, I look down at verse 6. Psalm 42, verse 6. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan to the heights of Hermon. So we have the Jordan River. That's where Caesarea Philippi, one of the headwaters is. And the heights of Hermon, of course, I'm beating this horse to death. Sorry, but I just want to show, right, if we go back to this, there's Mount Hermon right there. And that matches up with Caesarea Philippi. And then finally, let's go to Psalm 42, verse 9. Psalm 42, verse 9. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? That's the question that leads into the Midrash. Don't you remember in Egypt we were oppressed by an enemy? God will send two redeemers to the next generation. So I say to my God, my rock. Okay, go back to here. We add in, there's something about a rock. So Psalm 42, the living God, it's at Mount Hermon, and something about a rock. Now, let's go, turn if you will, to Matthew. It's only in Matthew's account. But let's go look at what do we find when we read Matthew's account about the, about the Caesarea Philippi event, okay? So let's read the Caesarea Philippi event from the standpoint, or how Matthew describes it. So it says, now when Jesus came into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, so we don't know exactly where they were in the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why does he add that phrase, the living God, to that text? And I think there's more answers than just an allusion to Psalm 42, but is that coincidence that Simon Peter answers that way? Okay, let's keep going. And then Jesus answered him and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also tell you that you are Peter. Now, we know his name, Simon. You are Peter. What is Peter? Well, the word Petros means rock, or Petros means little rock. You are a little rock. And on this Petra, rock, I will build my church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Interesting, isn't it? That if we go back here, and we say, oh, in the Caesarea Philippi event, we also have the phrase, living God. And then, again, you have the phrase, a rock, over here, in Caesarea Philippi. And you say, well, wait a minute. It's not just the transfiguration in Psalm 42 and 43 that are playing out. It's the Caesarea Philippi. And Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. And then. Jesus is going to point to Peter and say, now you're going to go forward. You're going to become the rock here. You're a little rock. You're not the rock. But you're going to be the stabilizing force. 
that brings the kingdom of heaven here on earth. All those little illusions, right? So what, the, way, the way this works in my mind is you have to think to yourself, what are the odds, right? What are the odds? Just do, because there are no coincidences with God. What are the odds that Psalm 42 has the phrase, the living God, and so does Caesarea Philippi? What are the odds that Psalm 42 mentions a rock, and then you have that exchange about the rock? And I don't know how it plays out. I don't know how it plays out that Jesus takes his disciples up here, that whole conversation happens. But I just want you to see the depth and the breadth of this book that we have in front of us. It's just remarkable. So I can remember I was sitting, I was, uh, I'd been studying in, in Israel, and I was sitting, we had some time, we had eaten lunch, and I was just sitting on my own at uh, Caesarea Philippi. And I knew that it was connected to Psalm, 43, or, uh, Psalm 42 and 43. But I didn't quite, I, at that time, I didn't have the depth of understanding that I do right, uh, that I do today. But, so I, I said, well, let me, let me read Psalm 43. And I read it, and I, I knew the verse 3 about the light and the truth. And then I'm like, well, you know what? I'm just going to read Psalm 42. And all of a sudden, it just jumps out at me. Living God, the rock, we're here at Mount Hermon. I mean, I was just sitting there staring at the, the old pan grotto. For those of you that have been to Caesarea Philippi, you know that stone wall where the, the water just comes right out of the wall, but the, where they have the grottos of, of uh, pan and all the nymphs there. And I'm staring at this rock and I'm thinking, whoa, Psalm 42 is even connected to this place. And it just kind of blew me away. Now, those are the moments, that's the power of illusion. Because what happens is, and the, why, the, the reason that Jesus and the gospel writers communicate like this is that if they, you know, it's easy for people to dismiss a message if you give them the answer. So what they do is they tell a parable, they, they, they use the biblical allusions, because then it's now the person who's dealing with God's words are suddenly having insight, and it's much harder to argue with either A, yourself, or B, God, who gave you the words. If you can simply drop an illusion that points their mind back, it's much harder to argue out of what you're telling them, and they get it. And I think that's why they get so upset. So it, it just, it blows my mind the again, the depth and the breadth of what's happening with, uh, with our New Testament and the genius level of understanding that those disciples and the first century audience had of the biblical text. And, you know, when I was growing up, you'd hear people talk about Christianity, a check your brain at the door type of place. You go in, you check your brain at the door, no thinking, everyone just tells you, you know, are you kidding me? I mean, maybe there's churches out there that just simplify it so much that, you know, people go in and think that it's, it's just, there's no, there's no substance to it. I mean, there, there, there's obviously, throughout the church history, you're going to have, you're going to have churches that do that. But the fact is, the nature of this book is utterly amazing. Now, it takes a while. It takes some work. And it takes a while. But when you get those little nuggets, it's like manna from heaven, right? It feeds your spirit in a way you don't understand. So our faith is not check your brain at the door. This is deep, and it's rich, and it's complex, and it's amazing to see. And, and it gets more amazing the more you study it. It's a never-ending well, is what it is. I mean, part of the reason that our scripture is considered to be sacred is because it's a never-ending well of wisdom and insight and to either your own life or the way that the world is structured and it's, you know, into the God's cosmos. It's never-ending. You know, when I first became a Christian, I read something that said, you can read the book of John as a one day of, of as a, the first day of being a Christian, you can read the book of John and get something out of it. But you can also be a, you can also study that book for the rest of your life, and you'll always find something. And I thought, 
that's just not possible with a, with a writing. Well, it is, because I'm continually blown away by what John is up to. But it takes some work, and we have to... The more you know the text, the more when you read it, those, these biblical allusions jump out at you. So, it just blows my mind. I hope this helps. I hope this helps with all of your biblical studies, because this is the way the new, you have to understand the rules by which the New Testament writers are writing. And when we understand the rules and we read it by their rules, yes, you have to do the work for the context, but man, it's much richer. So, okay, let me do a quick review. What did we do tonight? Well, it's all about this right here, the two main segments of the transfiguration event. I think I could be, I could be wrong. Again, you guys are going to, you'll judge whether I've, you know, pin this down or not, but I think that if we had to put two categories up there, it's showing that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel, and then it gives us a glimpse into something about the heavenly nature of who he is. And of course, then, what we're supposed to do as humanity is the, the creation of humanity goes forward. That's John's message through his gospel. Okay, my prayer is that if you've walked through all, of, all seven of these, God bless you for doing that. I have a firm belief that God will bless you in, this, uh, in the work that you're doing. To go through this, to see deeper into the text, God wants his people to go deeper into the text. And that's this, my entire ministry has been, uh, I, again, talking to my wife just a couple days ago, and she said, well, your ministry is to strengthen the roots of Christianity. I'm not out to evangelize people. My mission, as I've always felt, is to help the roots of Christianity grow deeper, have a deeper rooting in the Bible, so that when we show up in the world, we show up different, and the whole world changes. So that's my prayer for you as you go out and study your Bible. Thank you for spending this time with me on the Transfiguration. It's been a heck of a journey for me, and I really hope that it's been that journey for you too. It's a complex subject, so don't be afraid to go back and, you know, if you go for a walk, put on our podcast on Apple Podcast or Spotify or whatever. Let the information sink in again, and I guarantee you that over time you'll begin to see all of these things as the just unbelievable nature of this event uh, starts to reveal itself through God's Holy Spirit. All right, God bless everybody.